I think work environments make us sick. I've been to 14 doctors. She spreads all the reports across the desk and she's looking at me and she says, we can keep running tests or I can tell you what you already know. I think your job is killing you. I also suffered with a bunch of gastrointestinal issues. I had an eye twitch, my hair was falling out. The hair part is, I hear most often in the black women I interviewed. And I assumed and I was told that it was hormonal. There's this idea that success, you know, comes at the cost of our health. Where do you think people of color should put DEI within that list of factors they should be looking for with companies that they want to work for? The, the corporate workplace is not a meritocracy. You know, people who were put in positions of power to lead this change were actually afraid yes. mm -hmm. to create the change, to do the things that they were actually put in a position yep. to do. When you talk to actual DE&I leaders, though, they're tired, they're burnt out. Like, the fact that we think we can, you know, downplay this work or this is work that is, you know, only done when the economy is great or we have extra funds, quote unquote, is I think part of the challenge. The system is broken and how do we actually expand so there's more seats, right? That's that's where there's discomfort of you. So I would say, I think it's real for the, the people of color. I think the sense of you have to give off pieces of your identity, mute yourself, show up in a very you know whitewashed version of what we think leadership is, is real and true. And we have not talked about or unpacked enough what that does to us, right? The health implications, but also the psychological implications. There's so much more to money than saving it spending it, and making it grow. So we're digging deeper and exploring all the topics we only scratch the surface on in our book to uncover how money really affects our lives. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten, but most people know us as rich and regular. Maybe you've seen us on social media, read about us, or we popped up on your TV one day. The Saunders are rewriting the rules to achieving financial freedom. We're writers and creative entrepreneurs on a mission to inspire better conversations about money. Welcome to Cashing Out, the, the podcast. podcast. Whenever business leaders and politicians talk about diversity, you can almost guarantee someone uses the phrase melting pot. We need to uphold the great tradition of the melting pot. And uh, the United States is also a, a great melting pot. If we're not going to be a melting pot, because I grew up in Hawaii, a melting pot of races and customs. A lovely lady, liberty. The idea implies when we're all blended and working together, we're all better off than when we're standing alone. Sometimes they make other food references like gumbo and chopped salads to convey America's appreciation of different colors, cultures, and lifestyles. But in real life, things aren't so simple or delicious. In the real world, you can be the flavor of the month in February and too spicy for America's palate the next. This can be both confusing and frustrating for people of color and other marginalized communities who are trying to make a living while staying true to themselves. And in recent years, things have begun to boil over. Who better to weigh in on this than Deepa Prashathaman, author of The First, The Few, The Only, and expert on diversity, equity, and inclusion. She's an advocate for women of color, speaker, executive fellow at Harvard Business School, and most importantly, a truth teller. And I want to start with an impossible question to answer, uh, okay. which is I want you to predict the future. It's 2032, and we're looking at one of these recent reports about diversity in America, in corporate America. Uh, what do you want that headline to be? Mm. The headline I often talk about is that it's going to take us to 2050 to really see difference, right, in the ways mm. that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to see a headline that says by 2030, right, we're 20, 20 years ahead of where we expected to be. That would be, you know, would make me happy and make me feel good about this work. Um, you know, I, I'd like to get to a place where we've been through hard times and I think we're going to get harder on these topics before it gets better. And, and, you know, I'm not okay with that, but I also understand there's like an ebb and a flow and a, a you know, like a, a process to this that I think some people don't think about when they think about this work. And so... We're, we're really bringing people into the conversation at this stage of the game. So I think in, you know, by 2030, like I, I'm hoping everyone's in the conversation. I'm not, I'm not expecting everyone to be aligned, but we're just like beginning the conversation. So um, I, I'm hoping we're past the conflict phase, right? Where it's as polarizing as it is now um, and that we're having 
helpful conversations, right? Uh, especially in the workplace, because I I've probably been in 200 to 300 companies in the last eight months. And some of the conversations, I'm glad that they're doing it, right? And I, and I do it, I say that that's progress sometimes when I talk, but at the same time, some of the conversations are very superficial and some of the conversations are a lot more meaty and people really want to do the work versus the checkbox. And so mm. I'm hoping by 2030, we're past the checkbox, we're past the like, what is unconscious bias, right? The three questions that we all get, you know? <laughs> And that we're in a different place in this conversation because this work is hard. I mean, you all know it that. Is. Um, it's full of shame and pain and history. And so I just, I'm hoping everyone's in a place where they understand why this work is that way and that we're having more in-depth conversations. Yeah. yeah. There were so many um, parallels, you know, obviously just in kind of preparing for this conversation between our book and your book, the topics that you were talking about. But even when I think about your your, your TED talk um, and mm -hmm. you opened it with like, you know, like some nerve wrecking words, like deep. Uh, your job is killing you. Mm -hmm. There are parallels there as well, because mm -hmm. we had some very similar experiences and struggles mm -hmm. in our thirties, you know, in terms of not being able to cope with the stress and the strain mm -hmm. and the rigor of being, you know, road warriors mm -hmm. and then transitioning from that to being parents. And we know so many of the people that are in our community that are uh, struggling with that as well. Why did you feel like wellness was such an important topic yeah. to cover, not just in your talk, but also yeah. in your book? It's interesting. This morning, someone was asking me that, and I realized I've done, started to do more and more talks on burnout, right? And the health aspects, even though that's not what the book is about. I'm doing full talks on burnout, which I never expected to do, yeah. right? Um, I think it comes from my own story. So my own story of leaving come, came 21 years after being at Deloitte, being at one company. I had a, you know, what I call a magical career, right? I rose really quickly, had a lot of impact. And my decision to leave was, was two reasons. So one, one was um, my original calling, which was politics and policy. Like that's what I went to school for. That's what I thought I'd be doing the last, you know, seven, eight years in this country. It made me kind of really ask, like, am I doing my purpose in this world? And how do I get back to some of that? Which is very hard when you're in an intense job. There, there's not room for the things that you used to do when you were younger or that really called you. So really a purpose question. But then the second, the second issue for me was getting sick. So I am, you know, significantly into my career, 16, 17 years. The issues started to mount slowly over time. But over the course of three years, they really grew. So they started as small things like small things, right? I'm dismissing them already, but like headaches, which turned into frequent migraines, um, not sleeping well, stomach pains, adrenal fatigue, like things that um, leaky gut, like things that, that were smaller. And then over the course of three years, they really mounted. I spent eight months in bed. So I could not feel um, elbows down and knees down. Um, I had been in the TED talk you're talking about. I've been to 14 doctors. I'm in front of my 15, you know, I'm sorry, this is a 14th doctor. So I've been to 13 doctors, my 14th doctor. This is maybe the fourth or fifth time I've seen her. She spreads all the reports across the desk and she looks at me and she's giving me the side eye because I have my suitcase with me. She's a doctor I saw in San Diego and I traveled because I lived on a plane, right? So think about that. Like I'm going to medical appointments when I travel and she's looking at me and she says, we can keep running tests or I can tell you what you already know. I think your job is killing you, which is the line. Yeah. And she literally said that. And she said, what would you do if you didn't do a big job like this? Do you feel like you have to do a big job like this to be worthy? And then the big one don't you just see you're worthy being you? And I say this in the book, I willed myself not to cry, right? Like not to drop a tear because I felt like she had seen through me. And then I went to my hotel room and cried for like four hours straight. It took me three more years to kind of get out of that situation, right? To figure out like what, how could I give up my entire identity that I'd sacrificed so much for and especially being a first, which I, I think I've only really come to terms with. Like when you're a first, you hold the seat for a lot of reasons that are beyond yourself and you don't even understand that sense of responsibility. Um, and so, yeah, then it was a process of unpacking. Like, what is my identity if it's not my work? You know, who am I? Like, what do I want to do? How do I want to show up? And so that's really where that comes from for me, my own journey. But I would also share, and, and it sounds similar in your work, like I interviewed 500 women of color. And that is one of the stories. I say this in the book, the most surprising thing. And I have a piece coming out, um, or I should say, there's a piece in MIT that, that speaks to this. And it's the first time I've seen it in this language. But I think work environments make us sick, and I call it toxic with an S-I-C-K. And um, I'm excited that they're they're putting attention in research, you know, uh, 
numbers and, and uh, attention around it, because I think it's not a topic we talk about enough. We don't talk mm -hmm. about how stress manifests in the body and certain ways of working and being and this focus on productivity that we have, especially in this country, um, really damages us. You know, yes, we're talking about well-being and we've talked a lot about the emotional side, I think, during COVID. We haven't talked enough about the physical side. So the number one most surprising thing was literally three out of five of the women, um, you know, I, I say in the book, I say two thirds of the women would say that they are sick and not, not small symptoms, like literal physical symptoms, everything from heart palpitations to headaches, to fertility issues. And I list out the symptoms in the book, but they're real. And I have never seen it talked about that way. So it's a lot of what drives me because my doctors kept saying it's age, you know, you've turned 40. This is what happens when you're 40. And I'm like, this could be 40. Like this, this is like I'm dying. Right. And mine was a late stage Lyme di diagnosis. So I was really sick. I literally spent mm -hmm. three years trying to get well, but I'm surprised. Like when I share that story, the number of women of color, all kinds of women of color coming up to me saying, that's my story too. And I've started to expand my work a little bit because I'm hearing that's true of women. Like almost all of the women come up afterwards, the white women too, and will say, that's my story too. Or as a mom, I'm juggling too many things and I've sacrificed my health. There's this idea that success you know, comes at the cost of our health. And that's part of what I really want my work to be in the future is to really rewrite that narrative. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. For some, the phrase gives them the warm and fuzzies as the holy grail of corporate ambition. But for others, it's just the latest in corporate buzzwords used to give the impression that an organization is committed to doing good all while their actions tell a different story. According to a McKinsey research study, when companies get DEI right, they outperform their competitors anywhere between 10 and 30%. So why aren't more companies over-investing to be the most diverse, equitable, and inclusive companies imaginable? Well, it ain't that simple. Benchmarks change, objectives widen, and budgets get stretched. And the people who are put in charge to lead the change get burnt out trying to achieve the impossible. If we're being honest, in our own lives, we felt burned by DEI work. We believed when they said change was coming and we worked overtime to help make it happen, only for the result to be more of the same. So we wanted to know what Deepa saw, since she was at the forefront of this work and oftentimes in the room when tough decisions were being made. I love that because I, I, I relate to that so much for so long. I also suffered with a bunch of gastrointestinal issues. I had an eye twitch, my hair was falling out. And I assumed, and I was told that it was hormonal, that it was because of age, that I was perimenopausal, that I was all of these things, yep. but no one ever questioned whether it was related yep. to the environment that I was sitting in every day and that uh -huh. I was participating in the workplace. Yeah. I and am curious. Yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, in the stress of it, and I would tell you the hair part is I hear most often in the Black women I interview. So the hair falling out is like a common, yeah, uh, particularly yeah. in the Black community. So. Yeah, it's it's real. I, I know you've been in, uh, like you mentioned, a couple of hundred companies recently. Mm -hmm. I'm curious on how DEI leaders are interpreting this message. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that most of them are open to it? Or are you still finding resistance because it seems counter to the narrative that they're trying to, to push? Yeah, it's a complicated answer. I would say when I first started, I think there was universal like interest and acceptance. I mean, if you're going to have me come in, I think you're more open than you know, there's a lot of companies that aren't having folks like us come in, right? So right. I think you're open. I think there might have been more hesitation among certain seats, like certain roles or certain people or certain backgrounds. But in general, I was surprised at how warm a welcome it was. I was surprised about how warm and welcoming the white male executives were in particular, because I expect I wrote the book for women of color. I don't do a lot of translation in the book. Like, I don't say this is what this means. I just write it. And in the first couple of weeks, I was really confused. And I, I, so I know, I'm curious if you've gone through this, too. But like, I had to do a lot of translation because I wrote the book for women of color. In the first three to four weeks, it was all white men picking up the book. White male leaders saying, I want to do better, but I can't ask people like you anymore because I'm going to be told I got to go educate myself, but I don't know where to go. So that curiosity actually gets me excited, like makes me feel like there's optimism in this work. When you talk to actual DE&I leaders, though, they're tired, they're burnt out, like they, you know, they don't have the resources they were promised, they don't have the seat they were promised, the access, like, so I feel like more of them are jaded than ever before. 
Um, I feel like employees are probably a little bit more jaded when you look at like trust scores and things like that, that came out this summer, Edelman did a big research project. And yeah, so I think in general, people are skeptical, but I would tell you the segment that I thought would be the most skeptical has not shown up skeptically for me. Um, I think there's still some fear that seats are going to folks that look like you and I and being taken from them. And so I always try to like, that's the big thing that I think we have to do in DEI spaces. Like, is that's not the work. The work is not redistribution. The work is like, the system is broken and how do we actually expand so there's more seats? And I think anytime you get into a seat being taken from a white man and given to one of us, right, that's that's where there's discomfort. So I just talk about that openly and there seems to be acceptance around that. You know, I, I don't know what happens after I leave, but so far, so far, so good. Yeah. That is so validating. So I know. Thank you for that. I'm over here like, yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> because that that is 100 percent been our experience. Okay. And, That's and, awesome. and honestly, um, I can tell you as as authors, it was it was quite frustrating because uh, we have relationships with black executives, DEI mm-hmm. leaders, mm-hmm. and many of them were not nearly as supportive yeah. or vocal uh, in support of the book and, and the yeah. message and it felt awkward for us because we didn't want to make it seem as if, Hey, like you're a friend, throw me a bone. It was more so like, well, just considering the times that we're in and considering the message and considering your own company's pledges and promises, like it just kind of seems like a natural fit, but there was not nearly as much support from our black peers and black professionals in the early stages as compared to many yeah. of our white peers. They, yeah. I think, realize that actually it, it's on us, right? And yeah. so I do kind of see that as a sign of progress, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it was also a bit frustrating for yeah, us. I totally share it, that. It, it, it felt as if, you know, people who were put in positions of power to lead this change were actually afraid yeah. to mm-hmm. create the change, to do the things that they were actually put in a position yep. to do. I think that's um, true. And so with that said, you know, kind of thinking about that as a former senior level executive, to what extent do you empathize really with your your peers your peer group right i mean because we know being a senior leader is difficult it's, you've got a laundry list of impossible tasks things are moving fast you've got shrinking budgets and you know like to what extent do you understand and what do you think yeah. i think people who are um uh, i guess employees or you know aspiring to work for companies what do you think that they don't understand about how difficult and challenging uh those roles or, or that work is yeah, I have so many things. Mean, that's a podcast in itself or a discussion in itself. You know, I, I also should say, like, I think part of why, you know, I started with, I think it depends on where you ask this question and the timing of it, is I also think there's this looming recession conversation that by default mm-hmm. puts real pressure on DE and I. Like that's inevitably like every conversation I end up having is, well, do you think it's gonna be the same in the next three to five months because of the looming recession? Um, the fact that we think we can, you know, downplay this work or this is work that is, you know, only done when the economy is great or we have extra funds, quote unquote, is I think part of the challenge, right, is a real issue. I think for leaders, like the challenge is, and I talk about this quite a bit in my own work, is that there's a pressure to conform as you rise. And I found this for the women of color, too. Right? The, research, the reason I did the book was there was a senior woman of color in one of the first dinners that I did with my now business partner. But she was sitting there as we were just we didn't know we were going to do a project. I didn't know I was going to do a book. We were just kind of talking. And she said, she's a public company CFO, a black woman. And she said, I sit in a seat of power. or I sat in a seat of power because she was, she was close to retirement. And I don't feel powerful. Mm. And I kept hearing that over and over and over again from the women that I interviewed. So I would say, I think it's real for the, the people of color. I think the sense of you have to give off pieces of your identity, mute yourself, show up in a very you know whitewashed version of what we think leadership is, is real and true. And we have not talked about or unpacked enough what that does to us, right? The health implications, but also the psychological implications. But I think for leaders who are not that, I think... One, it's hard to understand. I think it's hard to manage. And I also think COVID has brought all these issues that we didn't fully understand. And a lot of leaders we have in place are great at p management, but they're not culture leaders. And I think what we're seeing in 2023 and beyond is that leaders, like culture is core to like how you run companies and success in a different way that we ever understood, even like two years ago, even a year ago. I think it's front and center. And if you don't know how to do that, everything else falls away, but we're still catching up a little bit to that message, right? And employees who see that, employees are making choices on where to work and how long they stay. 
based, yes, on what leaders say, but what companies do. Like there's a lot more transparency, a lot more honesty, and a lot more walking with your feet than I think I ever saw, right? Growing up in in, in companies or, or being in corporate America. I think it's really changed. I think it's only going to continue to change. Yeah. I, I think that's, uh, it leads me to my, my next question, which is, there's a long list of factors that people consider when they're thinking about places to work. And Mm -hmm. I agree with you, culture is at the top of that list. Mm -hmm. But given how long we have to wait for progress in the DEI space, where do you think people of color should put DEI efforts or enthusiasm or focus within that list of factors they should be looking for with with companies that they want to work for? Yeah. I mean, I think it should be there, but I think that that statement alone, like means so many different things to different people. So I almost feel like, you know, that success can mean leadership at the top. Like it does the leadership team look like the rest of society. It can mean advancement and promotion. It can mean hiring numbers. So I just think saying that they, people, companies do good, do good on de doesn't say enough. Like, I think we have to get more specific. So yes, I think it's important, but like, it's almost like the, the truth is in the details. Mm-hmm. I think it's more important to actually call people. And I tell the women I work with now to do this. I call, you know, black women at, at you know, wherever you want to go, even if you don't know them and just ask what it's like, because I think there is a different experience on what the numbers and the checkbox and the outward experience and what people are really feeling inside. And I wouldn't take one person's view. I would call, you know, three to five people and see how universal it is. Call people in the department you're going to. Because at the end of the day, yes, a company can have a good or bad reputation, but so much of individuals' experience is based on their manager and Mm -hmm. the group that they're working around. So you can have the best company in the world, but if you're working for a toxic boss, your experience, (laughs) it's going to be horrible. And it's it's not going to match the company. So yes, important. And I wouldn't even bother if, you know, they didn't, they didn't do well, but not the only thing, right? It's, it's, it's almost maybe just a, um, a criteria to even maybe interview. How about that, right? Yeah. You still got to do all the other work. Love that. Yeah. For every buzzword that makes us feel good inside, there are those that trigger negative emotions. Words like toxic, trauma, and the 2022 word of the year, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, gaslighting. When we think about the slow pace of progress of DEI in corporate America, it evokes all of those feelings. But if we can't even call it what it is, how can we expect anything to change? In our book, we challenge readers to be rich enough to speak your truth, because we believe when you have your financial house in order, you're more likely to stand up for yourself and your beliefs. And this is where DEI and our financial lives intersect. Many people are afraid to criticize their employers because they don't want to put their livelihoods at risk. Conversely, if they don't speak up, in some ways they're complicit in their continued mistreatment. It's a complicated game with very real consequences, but we found community to be a powerful force for change. When more of us decide to courageously push in the same direction, at the same time, amazing things happen. Because I'm wondering if you have this experience where Mm -hmm. You know, you've met with and surveyed hundreds, maybe even thousands of, of women of color. Do you find that they are um, hesitant to label their organizations as toxic or as racist? No, actually not. Um, uh, I mean, I will share with you. Well, and let, let me make sure, like the label itself or talk about their experience. You know, which one are you A little bit of both, right? In, in our experience, there has been... Um, great hesitance to Mm -hmm. use that word. It's Mm -hmm. almost like if I say that word, um, there's, there's nowhere to go, but out, right. Mm -hmm. Because there is no fixing that. Like it's it's like a, sounds like a choice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like calling someone racist, right. It's like, you can't take that back and they will more often than not deny it. And and so it's one of those things, um, uh, that, that has come up quite yeah. a bit, even though, again, whenever we would bring it up in conversation, yeah. we're really reflecting data and reports that we've yep. seen and surveys, like what you've done. So yeah. I'm just curious as to whether or not- I, I don't, I, I'm so fascinated. Like, I want to ask you questions. Like, I'm fascinated by that. No, I've not found that. So um, I, so part of what I do, right, I, I'm a co-founder of a company called Information, where we hold safe space for women of color and, and people talk about their work experiences mostly, right? So, so private, we don't talk about it publicly. So I would, I would tell, yes, a lot of people talk about their experience openly. So maybe not in general public, but in closed doors. I think, especially amongst other women of color, there's more sharing than I've ever seen before. 
I do particularly writing on toxic rock stars and toxic cultures, and I can't tell you how many people respond to that language. I will say, though, you're right in that they won't respond in, D, you know, like in, in the messages in LinkedIn. They'll DM me separately and tell me this is my experience. So maybe yeah. that's what you mean. Um, yeah. But I, would, I just held space, and I'm trying to figure out what I do with this work uh, with two professors earlier, sorry, last week. And we just called five women who had responded to me with toxic, like real toxic rock star experiences. So someone who's a high producer, but really bad behavior, uh, might not be a boss, but a colleague. And I am not sure what to do with what they shared with me. These were not women I knew, I literally had never met. And they showed up and they shared stories of everything from what you would expect, like um, someone trying to uh, demean their reputation all the way to um, physical abuse, like literal wow. sexual harassment and, and date rape, like the entire gamut. These were not women I knew. And so it was profound because of the fact that I think people are wanting to share their stories. Maybe it's really more about the space that we create, but um, yeah, I'm not finding that. I just feel like people, women are wanting to tell their stories, right? I, I struggle with like how to help and what to do next, but yeah, I, I I've not found that. I think people are willing to tell their stories, maybe label a company toxic. I've not asked that question. So I could see maybe that's the disconnect, but I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not um, wanting for stories or wanting for people saying they've had toxic situations or are working in a toxic environment. I think that speaks to um, quite honestly, the fulfillment of what you've built. I mean, you, you mentioned you've started an organization in for information. Yep. Um, and it is designed to be a safe space for women of color to yeah. do exactly that. Um, yeah. And to be fair, and, and even a critique to us, we haven't necessarily done that. And so that might actually be a, a contributing factor as to why uh, people are a bit hesitant. Mm -hmm. I also think that because so much of the conversations that we've been having have also been rooted in uh, kind of the financial implications. Yeah. I think yeah. there's there's the very real... Yep. you know, understanding of the consequence. If yep. I ruin my reputation or if I call yep. this person out or this manager out, it, it can have very real financial yep. comp, uh, implications for me. And so yep. I think that's probably why I think that's fair. contributed to it. Yeah. I also yeah. think like so much of my book is telling stories. I mean, yours is as well, but it's, it's um, people, women sharing their stories anonymously of like what their experiences are like. Mm. And so many, I mean, I, I'm sure you do too. I, I get messages weekly of women saying like, I see myself in this story or this was profound. I think because there's not enough of those stories shared. So I think they're, I mean, I will also share women tell me they're triggered by reading the book and they can only read two chapters and they have to put it down, right? Which I, I never expected. I was triggered for sure. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, and I didn't expect because I'm like, this is just, right? Stories or this is yeah. just. And so um, I think maybe that's the nature of how it was presented. I think maybe just um, it's calling for that. And I also say that my work in the world is making women realize being seen and heard, which I think is a lot of what we all do, but it's also that their experiences are not unique to them, like not in a bad way, but that there is a universal experience for many of us that is not being talked about in a systemic issue. So it could be the framing. I agree. Um, I also literally use the word toxic, right? Rockstar, toxic, this, toxic. So I think people are just comfortable using that language back to me. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll watch for it now. Like now I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. Cause I remember, um, you know, how there's some pieces of feedback that you get on your book that just kind of yeah. stick with you. Yep. There was a woman who read our book and she was like, it was so good, but it was also a little scary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was like, what's scary about mm -hmm. the truth? <laughs> like mm -hmm. these are, this is what's happening in the workplace that you go into. Mm -hmm. But I think it is a combination of everything that you're saying on top of socialized and conditioning to think that toxicity is the norm and yeah. that if you complain, you're just not cut out for it. Yeah. Yep. And it's almost this process of teaching people like there's a word for that. It's yep. not the norm. This is yep. actually quite harmful and doing harm. And so that's also part of the work is unlearning what you think is normal and yep. holding space for something that is far more like, healthy. Correct. No, I love that. And that's why I felt like the work was aligned for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And again, I think it's partly that I've done probably three articles, even in places like HBR using the word toxic. So yeah, I think mm, it's yeah. just a word that I use. And so people come back to me with, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I also think it's a very recent conversation, you know, and it we is. were talking about, you know, our process in writing. 
I sold my book six weeks after George Floyd's murder, right? Like, so mm. it was so brand new, like the conversation about race at work, right? Up till then, you know, I felt like I was going to go into companies and people were going to say it's a meritocracy, right? Like if you just do hard work, it's going to be okay. And my first sentence, like my big message is the, the corporate workplace is not a meritocracy. Like the system shows up differently for different groups. And I thought it was going to be booed and right. No one's going to pay me to say that. <laughs> I say that people now kind of shake their head. I mean, I need to explain, right? So people understand what, what I mean by that and unpack that, but I'm surprised. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think the conversation is also really evolving in these, you know, and we're writing as it's changing. That was actually my biggest fear. I was going to use words that weren't relevant anymore. So it's been in those ways surprising, but no, I'm, I'm, I feel like more women of color are willing to want to tell their story than ever before. Again, maybe not on public platforms. Like, so I, we did, we did an Instagram. We tried to like start a movement where people were sharing their stories on Instagram with avatars and no one wanted to do that. But privately people are sharing their stories. So. There were so many parallels between Deepa's book and ours. Maybe it was the timing in which they were published during the so-called racial reckoning. Maybe it was because both were written from the perspective of people of color. Or maybe it was because both books shared a similar setting, corporate America. However you look at it, both bodies of work come to similar conclusions, which is that something has to change. The institution and system as it exists today doesn't work for everyone. Work culture as it exists today is unsustainable and unhealthy. And DEI, though important and needed, isn't going to magically fix everything. So we have to find ways to continually welcome critique so we can improve outcomes for everyone. Or we can continue to believe in the fairy tale of meritocracy, which is flat out delusional. Going back to just so many of the parallels, which is like my neck hurts from nodding my head from reading your books. So I was like, gosh, yes, yes. Um, but in our book, we, we, we say something to the effect of um, the true cost of being the first is mm. being the only. Mm -hmm. uh, and the literal title of your book is mm -hmm. The First, If You, mm -hmm. The Only. So I'm wondering if you could just talk to me a little bit about how you landed to that title yeah. and a little bit about your personal experience with yeah. being the only. Yeah. Um, so I landed on it because, so let me back up and explain. So here I am at this point, you know, 16 years into my corporate career, maybe, you know, 17 years. Again, politics and not feeling well. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting pushed, I feel like in some ways, like my body is, you know, and I believe in like the body gives you messages and I've been ignoring it for years and now I really have to do something. It's my entire identity, right? And I'm a, a partner, right? I have given up all these things. I call it almost like tenure professorship. So I've gotten to the title and now I'm going to walk away. Like none of it made any sense externally. I'm thinking of leaving during COVID. So I left before it was called the Great Resignation, right? So just angst and I wasn't going to anything. Um, so in an attempt to figure out like what to do and where I wanted to go, I started gathering women of color. It started one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and I tell the story a little bit in the book and it was just kind of over dinner, over lunch. And then Ron and I, my business partner, ended up doing about 10 dinners across the country. Again, I was just trying to figure out where do I want to go next and like what's a great industry or company and instead, what we uncovered were these stories. We would get into rooms with like 20 executives. And again, we went executive just because of what I was looking for. All kinds of women of color, all industries. I thought one or two hours, six, seven, eight hours at two and three in the morning, we were still in the rooms finishing each other's sentences and telling stories. So from that came this idea that there's something unique about the experience about being a first, a few, or an only. Um, how I define that is you're the first in your family, you know, maybe to go to college or to have a professional, you know, um, experience, but there's something unique, right, about the first that experience that you have that a lot of people of color I interview, like have that sort of like you've had to figure it out yourself. The few comes from, right, you're one of the few in your company, right? There's stories that are profound in the book about like, like being the only black woman in an organization and having to represent your race or being the only Muslim woman, right? And having to talk about your religion, right? So the, the sense of few and then only, right? Like one of the only women at the C-suite. So there was something about that, right, um, that really felt unique to women of color. And I also think we hold up like these few examples we have of people who've made it. And I don't want to take anything away from them, right? But we hold them up. And like my tag when I sign my book is from the first of few, the only to the many, right? Like I want to talk about how we get to the many, not just hold up the trailblazers because there's such a shadow side, which is what you talk about, right? To trailblazing or to being an only, but we like 
don't give space for them to talk about it because it is mm -hmm. hard. It is lonely, but there's no glory in talking about the negative side of it. So that's really what I wanted to give voice to that. These women are all amazing, but we're asking them not to talk about the hardship, but really just, you know, yay, you made it. But we need to talk about the, the how we got here and the pain if we're going to really change. Moms will say, or the women of color I interviewed would say, I want to do it differently. Like, I don't want to put that pressure on perfection, right, on my daughters. I don't want to tell them they're going to have to work two or four times as hard as their co white colleagues. And yet they get to that phase and they do because they don't know what else to tell them. Yeah. Um, so I would, I mean, my advice in that space is really like, remember what didn't work for you and try not to give it to the next generation. I mean, I think you have to be honest, right? Like you walking in the world is different than me walking in the world is different than like, you know, a white man walking down the street. And we have to, I don't want our kids to not be prepared for what they may face at the same time. I want to do it differently. And so that's, I think the tension in the model, right. Of like, how much do you share about to be prepared versus how much are you shaping? like? Mm. The, the overwork and the perfection. So I call it, right, I call it performing, producing, and conforming uh, a little bit in the mm. book. Those behaviors, which I think are just what happens in a lot of our cultures. That was probably one of my favorite parts of the book. You talk about, I believe there were 10 delusions that mm -hmm. you found people had um, about their careers and what they might expect in the workplace. Um, one, that word choice, I think, is so bold. So bold. Um, but also so perfect. Yeah, because we, we, we talk a little bit about just the um, how wildly optimistic so many of us are, not just mm -hmm. about our financial lives, but what we expect to happen in our careers. Like everyone believes that they're going to climb the ladder mm -hmm. at some predictable rate. Mm -hmm. um, everyone kind of projects uh, this idea that they will always earn as much as they're earning now, mm -hmm. if not more in the foreseeable future, even though there's very little data to suggest that that's true yeah. for anyone, but particularly people of color. Mm -hmm. But I'd never thought about that as delusional. Mm -hmm. I never decided to use that word. And mm -hmm. so I'm glad that you did because it takes the pressure. Now you've given me license. To use. <laughs> yeah, no, I love, I love that you love that word. Yeah, yeah. I would love for you to just talk about yeah. why you chose that word yeah. and some of the most important, I guess, delusions that you think yeah. uh, many of us are experiencing as we're thinking about our careers. Yeah. You know, I think this is going to be my work going forward. So I love that you love that. I would also tell you that many of the white male leaders, that's the chapter they can't get past, meaning in a positive way, like that that's the chapter they come back to. Because I think it, it, by the way, I think the delusions speak to everybody, but no one's yeah. really sat and thought about it, right? Like, I, I think a lot of them are are delusions for a society, for America in particular, right, and how we work. So the delusion idea, and, and at one point the book was going to be called Inclusion Delusion, because it was this paradox on the more that you try to be included, or the more you rise, the sense that you're going to be, you know, belong and included. And in fact, what I found is the more the women of color rose, the actually less they felt included, because there was more pressure to behave and perform and conform. So it comes from some of that. But I think there's a lot of the ways that we work Again, that don't work for us that we haven't really spent time unpacking. Some of it, you know, relates back to enslavement. Some of it relates back to this idea of the two parent household, like the, our entire work week. The way we work is based on this idea that there's two parents. One parent goes out into the workplace and that one stays home and raises the children. That model's okay. never been updated, right? And that's what the 45 hour week is based on. Um, so it's like these ideas of like the way we work are things that we've inherited and they're kind of built on broken and, you know, inappropriate or egregious or um, bad, right? <laughs> Policies and procedures and, and ways of working. And so like one of the big questions I have in general is like, can you remake or do we have to completely take down before we can, you know, get to a place where we want to, to get? That's, that's like my bigger, you know, where I sit, I spend a lot of my, my time dreaming and thinking. But I think the delusions are really these things that we've been taught about how it is that I don't believe has to be how it is. And yet most of us haven't been taught that we can question the system. We can push on the system. And I find this, especially with the people of color that I work with, right? They've been taught like, you know, asking questions, attention, um, pushing on the system can bring really bad results. And as a result, we kind of all, you know, don't push back on things that don't make sense. So the 10 delusions, I mean, they're probably going to have been 50, but they're things from like, there's not enough qualified women of color or people of color. Well, that's a delusion because if you had my network, you would find them. If, we had, if they had your network, they would find them. It's literally, you know, this bias that we tend to have networks that look like us. And so that's kind of an example of a delusion. 
Another delusion is this idea of, and I said this before, this idea that the, the, the pie is set or the tables at the, the seats at the table are set. Like there's 12 seats at the table. So if I'm up for a board position or a C-level position, I'm going to take it from somebody else because it has to go to a woman of color or a woman. So that, that why I call it in a delusion of, you know, got, I got white man, like this idea that we're taking and redistributing is another one, right? So, and then the idea that DEI is going to fix everything, right? Like it's not, this is cultural. This is, this is generational. This is like, you know, so entrenched in how we think and we behave as people. And there's such shame and pain associated with it. So I just, it's like these ideas that we haven't unpacked, but I also think there's other ones, right? About how we work and that it has to be lonely to rise, that we can't rise with community, that this work, like, you know, that being successful is individualistic. So there's, this is a lot of where my work is headed. Um, this idea, you know, and I'm, I'm playing with this title still, but the corporate fairy tale, that this idea mm. that, you know, that, that story, that ending doesn't work for most of us. And so what is, what, you know, how do we want to rewrite it? What should that story look like? And I just think, yeah, I want us to question what we've been taught about work, like how we have to show up, what we have to do, what we have to trade. And this is more your work to, to make money. You know, and I want us to say like that's not how we want to operate anymore. So that's really where the delusions came from. But I think we could write a book. I, I've, I've thought about that. Just an entire book on delusions, I think, would be powerful too. And the delusions, by the way, show up in all aspects of our life, not just work. Even the things that's we believe true. about our our partner, right? How what we believe about ourselves. These are things we've been taught, and we've never been encouraged to question. Like there are things I, I say in the book. Like there are things we're, we're you know told are given. And I guess I'm like one of those people that I always ask why, like my friends will always like, Deepa, you ask why all the time and why drives me? Like, why is it that way? Like, why can't we change it? And so that's really what it's about. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it really was a great book. Um, I, I, it was just fantastic. And so I look forward to sharing it. I'm grateful. I feel the same way. A, so. a yeah. valuable resource that yeah. you can share, share with other people. I'm also grateful that I do not have to be you know, I'm trying to find less to do these days. And so, you know, it's always great to find an expert, someone uh, that you can just point people to as opposed yeah, well, to. Like, I'm doing the same thing, so don't point them to me. Yeah. <laughs> Are we the first, the few, and the only? <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode of Cashing Out the Podcast. To see more videos like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to turn on your notifications. To get your copy of Cashing Out the Book, visit Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore, or download the audiobook on Audible. 